And I'm going to ask our president, C. Shane Reese, if he might just step forward and welcome folks here and say a few words as we get underway. President Reese. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Paul, for giving me the opportunity to say welcome to everyone. Uh, it, it is with uh, great honor that uh, we welcome Sherry Dew, uh, a distinguished alumnus of BYU. And, and as I think about this event, which we all have to gather together to, to hear from wisdom and uh, experience that Sherry brings as a, a world-class communicator, and, and as a tremendous disciple of Jesus Christ, I, I'm reminded of what we at BYU are really about, which is trying to become the Christ-centered, prophetically directed university of prophecy. And, and, and we talk about seven things that are, that, are, that are surrounding the ideas of becoming that university, and Sherry Dew exemplifies two of those in such important and fundamental ways, and I think you're gonna hear that tonight. She has mastered what it means to be bilingual. Someone who can speak so definitively and expertly in her discipline as a communicator, but also to talk so eloquently and beautifully as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That double heritage that President Kimball talked about so amazingly in the second century address, Sherry Dew is one of the brilliant stars that he spoke about. And I love that she's here with us on this campus. She also has such an amazing ability. When we talk about the courage to be different, we're talking about someone who will stand up and be a champion for faith. Someone who will be uh, a representative of the, of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ in all of the various places and to stand up with a voice bold and courageous. And Sherry Dew has done that. And so I can't imagine another person that I would be more uh, excited and thrilled to have back, Sherry, back on our campus to represent what it means to become BYU. So to each one of you, I extend a warm welcome and thank you for being here with us this evening and especially to you, Sherry. We thank you and welcome you to being here on this campus. I thank you so much, President Reese. Such a pleasure to have you with us. I've asked Mark Callister, Callister who is the director of the School of Communications at BYU, uh, if he would introduce Sherry. And uh, just a few words about Mark. Prior to coming to BYU in uh, 2005, Mark was teaching at Western Illinois University. He received his baccalaureate degrees here at Brigham Young University in international relations and in English, a, a, an MBA here at BYU, and then went on to earn his PhD in communication at the University of Arizona. His research interests include adolescence and the media, family and the media, visual imagery and advertising, um, the role of persuasion in nonprofit fund fundraising, and as a specialist in all those fields has been called upon by Fortune 500 companies and national nonprofits to help consult them. He teaches courses in research methods, media effects, persuasion, and very relevant to tonight's lecture, media and religion. So will you please join me in providing a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Collister. Thank you, Paul. It is a privilege to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. I have to tell you that in doing some research for this introduction, I learned that Sherry likes very short introductions, so I'm excited that this may be her favorite introduction ever as I give this. 
Um, first of all, Sherry, thanks for being with us. We're so excited to have you. Sherry Dew is a native of Ulysses, Kansas, and a graduate of Brigham Young University. She has authored several books, including the biographies of Ezra Taft Benson and Gordon B. Hinckley, as well as the book Insights from a Prophet's Life, Russell M. Nelson. Her most recent book is entitled Prophets See Around Corners. Sherry served as a second counselor in the general presidency of the Relief Society from 2000, 1997 to 2002. She's currently the executive vice president and chief content officer at Desert Management Corporation. And if we could give her a warm welcome tonight. Good evening, it's a treat to be with you. I'm a, I'm a little overwhelmed, actually, uh, because there's some, so many people in the room for whom I have profound respect, starting with Elder Gilbert. We used to have offices side by side. I pretty much drove him crazy. <laughs> Learned a lot from him before he became Elder Gilbert and uh, asked him what in the world he was doing here on conference week, and week but grateful that you and Christine would be here. Uh, President Reese, I, I, I'm going to try, and I have now a new standard to try to live up to. Thank you. I also have a lot of respect for the Wheatley Institute and for the way it's expanding and trying to absolutely have profound influence. Uh, Paul Edwards, I had the chance to work with Paul some years ago as well and know how talented and skilled that he is. And then Governor, uh, I'm a fan, Governor and Mrs. Herbert for sure, and, and to all of you here, thank you so much for coming. So. Let's dive in and let me tell you what they've asked me to do is spend a few minutes talking about faith and media. And then I think we're going to have a conversation that Paul and I will have and, and take some of your questions. But let me set the stage for this and give you a little background to start with before we start looking at, at a few slides and maybe a few statistics. So it was mentioned that I uh, work for Desert Management Corporation, which in essence operates many, not all, but many of the for-profit businesses that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints owns. DMC operates all of the for-profit media businesses that the church owns. Um, it's Bonneville International, it's radio and TV, it's Deseret News, uh, Deseret Magazine, it's Deseret Book, and all that it entails, it's, uh, and a number of other companies. It also op operates the Radiant Foundation, and about two and a half years ago, through the Radiant Foundation, we started exploring the issue of faith and how it's treated by media. How are faith and people of faith and religion itself, how are they represented in, in the media? And we started by saying, well, we have suppositions about this. We think we're not treated very well. But let's go do some research. So what I'm going to show you is what we have uncovered through various bodies of research that we have done about faith and its treatment in by news media and also faith in its treatment by entertainment media. Now surely you're having going through your mind already images of the kinds of things and headlines that you've seen or the kinds of movies you've seen and how they represent people of faith or religion itself. But I want to show you what some of these global studies show. But before I do that, if I could, a quick story to begin. In um, June of 2020, my, my mother passed away. Now the pandemic was just really in full on, you know, just it had captured all of us. We were doing social distancing. We weren't yet going back to church. Uh, all kinds of things were happening and mom passed away. We, I was raised in, in Kansas and so my mother and father had lived there for 60 years. She was living out here with us at the time but we managed to get her home to Kansas and were able to have a very small memorial. Again, we were lucky that the stake president in our little Kansas town even allowed us to use the building because church wasn't back in session yet in person. But the stake president allowed us to use the building just for our family and a few friends. We probably had 70 people there, 55 of whom were family members. We held a little memorial for mother. Now, the little town I'm from is a, has a roaring population of 4,500. So we come out of the little chapel, and there is a policeman waiting to give us an escort to the little country cemetery four or five miles away, like we need an escort in a four-stoplight town, right? 
But there he was, and he was. we went over to talk to him and thank him, and he said, oh, we would never think of your mother being laid to rest without having an escort. So the cortege got behind the, the uh, uh, policeman, and we start making our way out to the cemetery. Partway there, and you're, you know, and you're going kind of slow. Partway there, we look over at a side street, and there is a woman who's gotten out of her pickup, Kansas, farm country. She's gotten out of her pickup. She has this hand on the hood of the pickup, and her head is bowed like this. And I'm telling you, there was something about the sight of that woman with her head bowed as we drove by. I just burst into tears. It touched all of us so deeply. I'm sure that woman has no idea who was in the hearse. I have no idea who she was. I don't know if she's religious. I don't know anything about her. But in that little moment, I saw profound reverence and respect demonstrated by this unknown woman. I, I have her image emblazoned in my mind and heart ever since because, number one, it was a tender day. Here's a woman paying respect to my mother, even though I'm sure she didn't know who it was. But I also have said to myself, how often when you read the paper, not a paper anymore, how often when you read news online, or how often when you go and sample any kind of media, do you see that kind of a depiction of that kind of person in the country? I'll bet you there are way more of that women in this country than we think. But that's probably not what we see a lot in how people, and I would assume she's a person of faith because of her bowed head, I'm not sure we always see them represented and given their full due. Now, with that in mind, let's, let's just look at a few things that may put this in context. For decades now, I have collected, I've got files of cover stories and articles, and I, it's going to look like I'm picking on Time Magazine, which I'm not really picking on Time Magazine, but it was just easier to make them all from Time, to say, I've got files and files of articles where the national press has tried to talk about some facet about God or religion or faith or something. And it has always felt distorted to me. Now, with that as a background, let me show you a short video to, to kind of cue up what we tried to do when we set out to try to say, could we make a difference? Could our little company make a difference in how faith and people of faith and religion are treated by various forms of media. I think that should be playing. There we go. It's one of the most natural, most instinctive things we humans do. Reaching upward to our God. Since the dawn of time, in every corner of the world, we have prayed, chanted, meditated, and danced to connect with that source of love and joy and peace. But this spiritual connection is in danger. Cultural taboos, silence, voices of faith, media algorithms perpetuate misinformation. Defensiveness sows distrust. Cynicism snuffs out spirituality but we can turn the tide by engaging individuals and institutions in discussions of faith, amplifying stories of those who believe, and empowering people in their spiritual journey, we can elevate faith in culture and help each person experience how beautiful it is how fundamentally human it is to connect with God. Now, what this next uh, slide says is basically that uh, the Faith in Media Initiative, which is the initiative that, uh, that we launched, that has been trying to improve collaboration and an understanding between faith and media. So, Pew, several years ago, released this statistic. 
that 84% of humankind is affiliated with a religion. Is that what you would have guessed? Based upon what you see in the press and elsewhere, would you believe 84% is still affiliated with a religion? I didn't believe it when I saw that. I said, where's the source? It's Pew, pretty great source. So why then does a preponderance of today's stories about faith in news media and entertainment lack accuracy, truth, you lack the, prof the profundity, the profound nature of faith, and why does it lack hope? It, that's one of the questions we've asked ourselves. So one of the things we did, we've done several global studies, and one of the studies that we did was basically a third-party expert AI research that we, a study that we gathered from over 30 million sources, basically went out and scraped 30 million sources that represent the thoughts and attitudes from across the socio-political spectrum included clergy, journalists, consumers, and others. So that's what we did. This is the first study we did. Then we also uh, hired Harris X, globally renowned, to survey about 10,000 people across 18 countries in various languages. We tried to include all the world's major religions. We did 30 in-depth media interviews with senior media executives. Now let me show you what we learned from these studies. We've also done, Harris X just finished a major study on how faith and people of faith are treated by the entertainment media. We just released those results uh, in a partnership with Variety Magazine in Hollywood a few weeks ago. Probably won't have time to go into that, but, it, but the results are very similar to these studies which really scraped news media. So what we learned is this, that 59% of those uh, surveyed said that it's important for news to cover diversity in faith and religion, that it should be covered. 63% said that too much faith-related content is rooted in controversy. They're happy to report on when there's some trauma that happens, when there's something really unfortunate that happens in a religion or with religious figures, but not willing to tell the real stories of regular people. They said 61% believe the media perpetuates faith-based stereotypes rather than protecting against them. 63% said that high quality content on faith and religion is in fact needed. 53% say the media actively ignores religion as an aspect of society and culture. 78% believe faith stereotypes need to be addressed as much or more than stereotypes regarding race and gender. 43% say feel the media's current approach to religious coverage creates unease and anxiety. 56% said they would be more likely to engage with media that offers high quality faith and religious reporting. 56% media should provide more coverage on complex religious issues. 84% faith and religious groups need to provide, this is an interesting one, need to provide the media with spokespeople, particularly people with lived religious experience. So the question we've asked ourselves is, how can we help? How can we elevate people of faith, faith, people of faith and religion? Because we're dealing with a vicious cycle where if faith is muted, it means that we don't become literate about faith which means that faith practice, is, practice diminishes, which causes us to mute faith further and so forth. Could we instead shift to a virtuous cycle where we champion faith, where we model faith, where faith is practiced? What if we could shift into a mode of educating, modeling, and even activating? These are some of the questions we have asked ourselves. Now, another quick video. Religion is a very important part of my upbringing, the backbone of my development. I don't think I've ever seen anything in the media that depicted the type of experience that I had growing up. And what the media gets wrong is they don't see the full person. People's understanding of religion is really shaped by media. We have really well-documented evidence that when the show 24, which was a terrorism-related show, was on air, the next day you would see a spike in reports of Islamophobic hate crimes. Growing up, you can't help but internalize a lot of those narratives that you're going to look like the other and you're going to be discriminated against. One of the knock-on effects of the, these portrayals is I think 
it probably fragments our culture, our society more. If someone is other, then it's very easy to, uh, number one, you don't want to learn from them. Number two, you don't want to be around them. And number three, it's very easy then to hurt them. Yeah, anytime someone becomes the other, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. One of the things that I've learned in, in my lifetime is that facts and information doesn't actually change people's behavior, right? Like the way that we actually create empathy in people's hearts is through storytelling. Faith and media are both really important to society. They're storytellers, they bring community together, they provide tremendous support and insight. The biggest worry is when the two sides aren't at the table. When faith feels that it can't trust media and when media feels it's not allowed in the room to talk about faith, that's where a problem persists. It's not just that journalists often lack the training to cover religion, it's also that they, they don't know where to go to find the information that they need, right? The resources are really lacking. A major goal for a Faith and Media Initiative is not to demonize, villainize, or point fingers, but to understand why things are the way they are. Are there opportunities for us to provide tools, resources, training, research, support, so that both groups can do a better job to ultimately serve their readers and their members? The reality is all of us here are human, and there's a lot in common, a lot more in common between all of us than there is different. As humans, we need to keep pushing, to keep growing, to keep evolving, right? We don't understand everything, we won't ever. But if you think you do, then you're gonna stop growing. People around the world are saying that they would consume more media if it had more faith in it. People crave these stories. And I wish we heard more stories about people of deep faith who are actually trying to bring hope and healing and connection to others and not just trying to you know, push people away or, you know, condemn others. Um, there's a lot more hope out there in faith than I think we often hear. Can we go to this mic? Is it on? One of the things that we've learned in the last two and a half years is that it's surprising how many individuals there are uh, in working for major brands or people of influence who resonate with the message of saying, we've got to do better. We can do better. We can use our voices to be more fair and more, uh, more believable and more honest about what faith does in the, in the lives of people uh, and what religion can do for individuals. Now, there are challenges. One of the challenges is that religion is, tends to be marginalized in the newsroom, and there are different reasons. First of all, newsroom economics today has taken away a lot of specialists, including religion specialists. There's a fear of getting it wrong, and religion has become politicized in many settings, and so that causes people uh, concern, especially the journalists and reporters and otherwise. Newsroom tend to, newsrooms tend to lack diverse religious perspectives, and in both, in both Hollywood, in both um, the producing of different kinds of, of uh, movies and other kinds of programs, and in news newsrooms, uh, th those jobs tend to appeal to a more secular audience. And so you can go into a newsroom and have a hard time finding someone who's a person of faith. So when a person who doesn't believe in faith tries to write about faith, that's just foreign territory completely to them. Editors, they, there are cliques for controversy. Editors don't believe religion drives engagement unless you're talking about the latest trauma involving some religious figure. And and I think this is a crucial one for all of us to pay attention to. There are a lack of really credible spokespeople inside of religions or from people of faith who are willing to speak up and say, no, 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 let me tell you. Wait, let me tell you the difference it makes in my life because I believe in God. Let me tell you the difference it makes because I pray and so forth. The, the bottom line is that when faith and media misunderstand each other, it's what that little diagram showed. Faith is muted. Literacy, understanding, knowledge about faith diminishes. Those considering the importance of faith may be dissuaded. And then here's a big one. Those looking for hope or peace or guidance may not even consider that religion or faith or God can make a difference in their lives because they're not seeing it anywhere. They don't see it in what they read. They don't see it in what's online. They don't see it in the theater. So just as a recap, over the last... 30 months or so, 
The Faith and Media Initiative has conducted these studies, which I've mentioned. And then we've said, what can we do? We've trained more than 1,300 journalists about faith at the Columbia School of Journalism and at the USC School of Journalism, also at the Harvard Divinity School, at the National Press Club, at the Google News Lab in Mexico City, at the National Association of Black and Hispanic Journalists, and more. So we started to try to train journalists, but that's like a drop in the ocean, and it's really slow going because it's a few journalists at a time. A few other things that we've done. We've participated in some major gatherings of business and media executives at the Vatican, at the Shard in London, at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, and at Concordia in New York City. We've built a coalition of about 75 organizations and people of influence to champion a more accurate treatment of faith in all media sectors. And we've entered into an agreement with Forbes. And you'll see forthcoming, before long, they're gonna do their first ever list of faith-centric organizations and influencers who, have, who incorporate faith in their business, and that's a first. Um, an interesting experience, we, we hosted uh, Seth Cohen, who is the Let's see, he is the uh, chief impact officer at Forbes. Had that right, Aaron? Chief impact officer at Forbes. He runs the Forbes Impact Lab. And he was here in Salt Lake City with us uh, last fall. We hosted a luncheon for him and were able to ask him some questions during this luncheon for all to hear. And one of the things we said to him is, why, is, why does Forbes care about faith, faith and how it's treated by the media? And he said, well, you've made us care. Some of our team, wasn't me, I can't take a lick of, of credit, but some of our team had spent enough time with him and some others at Forbes to convince them that this ought to be one of the things they build lists around. They're famous for their lists. This ought to be something they should include. Now, let me, um, I wanna show you just a couple more slides and then and make a conclusion, if I could. Uh, the Radiant Foundation also teamed up with Gallup at an event in London last fall. And here are just a few other findings. So. Think about the news or other forms of media that are saying, no, 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 faith is, faith is for blind sheep. Faith will do you no good. Faith, religion is dangerous. In contrast to that, Gallup has done some studies that say that globally, those with a greater commitment to spirituality or religion have higher community engagement. So this says that religion's more important to them that have significantly higher, that those who say religion is important to them have significantly higher scores on Gallup's Civic Engagement Index. Globally, the difference is 4.8 points in North America. The difference is 10.3 points um, in North America. Globally, the difference is 4.8. Sorry, I read that wrong. And in North America, the difference is 10.3 points. That's a pretty big difference, statistically. In their study, Globally, those with a greater commitment to spirituality or religion have better social connections. So approximately 100 million more people who identify as religious have others they can turn to in times of need than do those who are not religious. So think of it. Think of having no one to turn to in a time of need. Globally, studies have found links between spirituality and lower rates of depression, suicide, addiction, and isolation. Now, look at this second bullet. At least 444 studies have now examined relationships between religion and spirituality and depression. Dating back to the early 1960s, of those, 61% reported significant inverse relationships with depression. So let me conclude this portion by, um, by saying a couple of things. Uh, one more experience and then maybe a concluding thought. A couple summers ago, uh, we were at the Vatican um, meeting some of the individuals there who have responsibility for for-profit businesses that the Vatican owns. And so they were willing to meet with us because we represent for-profit businesses that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints owns. As part of that whole trip, I had a chance to sit at a dinner, one of those 87-course Italian dinners that never ends, but I had the chance to sit next to a woman by the name of Patricia Murray, everybody in the Catholic Church calls her Sister Pat. Some say that she's the most influential woman in the Catholic Church because she has the ear of Pope Francis and she is the head mother superior. 
So she's the mother superior over all mother superiors, which means that the well-being of their nuns, their millions of nuns, falls under her direction. She was absolutely adorable. An Irish woman, uh, 70, in her 70s probably, and as this dinner drove, uh, wore on, we just had an absolutely delightful conversation. We talked about all kinds of things. Our families and our interests and what she was finding as she went around the world trying to help those under her care. It was, it was a fabulous conversation. And toward the end of our dinner, she turned to me and she said, who would have thought we would have so much in common? She said, why do you think that is? Because we're not alike at all. And I thought about that for a minute and I said, well, Sister Pat, I said, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that you're probably not going to be baptized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to convert to Catholicism. We, so we kind of see religion a little bit differently. And I said, but there's something we have in common that's really, really bigger than that, and that is we both feel accountable to God. And we believe God, and, and for both of us, we believe that Jesus Christ makes all the difference in our lives. That's a huge point we have in common. And we just kind of hugged each other and got to see each other again last summer and looking to more forward to more opportunities to do that. Don't we sort of wish that when we went online, we went to our favorite news source or our favorite, our, our favorite site where we go, that when we went to the theater, that when we went anywhere and consumed media, don't we wish that that were depicted? Number one, respect for each other and what we believe, but also a profound willingness to talk about what really matters, which is something greater than ourselves. I think that one of the great challenges we have as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or as students here at BYU is to try to learn to speak bilingual. President Reese talked about speaking bilingual. Yes, we need to learn to tell the story of the Restoration and do it compellingly, but we also need to learn to talk about what, we, what really makes a difference in our lives and do it in a way that we can do it with anybody. The person in the seat next to us on the plane, Sister Pat at dinner, or whomever it is to just talk about what a difference it makes to be a believer, how profound that difference is, what a source of comfort it is when we get on our knees and pray and know that there's help for us because we pray. What a comfort our beliefs, beliefs bring to us in a world that has some chaos in it. And whether it's, whether it's our little organization trying to influence Forbes or any of us trying to influence others by the way we, by what we post online and how we talk about it, or by what we do in our circle of influence, it seems to me that it behooves all of us in the time in which we're living with the covenants which many of us have made, that it behooves us to figure out how to talk about this in a way that is natural and inviting. And so my, my invitation, BYU, as far as I'm concerned, should lead the charge in developing journalists and broadcasters and communicators and, and storytellers and script writers who can speak in a way about faith that invites everybody to sample faith, religion, and everything that goes with it. And I think each of us, having made covenants, can do more than we could ever believe we can do if we just learn how to talk about it and are, are open about talking about it in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. I feel deeply that this is a commitment that each of us probably made premortally and can make now to do better in expressing what we believe. I hope some of this has been interesting to you, giving you food for thought, and particularly food for thought to say, what can I do? What can I do in my sphere of influence, however big it is and wherever it goes, to make a difference in championing the fact that we know we have a Heavenly Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, and we believe following them makes all the difference. Thank you. Sherry, let's uh, 
take a few minutes here and chat about what you've just shared. And I want to begin where you ended, actually, is when we think about, you know, students in this audience uh, wanting to participate in exactly what you talked about, what's the kind of portfolio of training and experience that they should be putting together that they can be effective? Um, Who would you hire? Who would I hire? Yeah, I mean, I'd hire you. <laughs> <laughs> From, you know, what, as you look out here, what, what do they need to bring to the table to, to engage in this? Uh, boy, that's a good question. So, so maybe I answer it by giving this experience. Uh, in 2003, the White House appointed me as a delegate to the Commission on the Status of Women at the United Nations. I didn't have a clue what that meant, to tell you the honest truth. I had never stepped foot in the United, United Nations before, and it was a completely foreign environment. That commission goes on for several weeks. I spent a good part of the time figuring out what it actually did and how it worked and how to have influence. But here's what I started doing, because I realized really fast, like day one, oh, you got to learn. You got to figure out how to say what you believe without it sounding like Sunday school. A lot of the groups there at the UN are very, very liberal, very secular. And there are some groups that, are, that line up with uh, my beliefs quite a lot. But I realized I was grossly underprepared. So my hotel was about a 20 minute walk from the UN. This was in the spring. That commission is held year, every year in March. And every night what I did was as I walked back to the hotel, I started practicing answers. Okay, if you were being interviewed and asked this, how would you answer it? And then when I got back to my hotel, I, if I didn't have an evening event, I would order up a salad or something, pull out my laptop, and start asking myself hard questions and trying to answer them. I still have that notebook. I've never thrown it away because for however long that, that thing went, like two or three weeks, Every night I was practicing, and it was foreign territory for me. I think part of this is practicing. Whatever your discipline is going to be, if you're going into nursing, great. If you're going into communications, great. But practice how you would talk about it, and not over the pulpit at church. Talk about, learn to talk about it differently, sitting to the guy next in the plane. Okay, so, so you're saying you need to get hard questions from Sherry Dew no. in order to be trained. No, Is we that... all know the hard questions, right? We can all, we okay, can anticipate I, I, the hard I'm gonna questions. I'm going to push on that. Uh, do we all know the hard questions? So, you know, what, if I'm, again, think of our undergrads or grads out here who is, they're engaging in the world. Where should they get those hard questions? Okay, so I'm going to push yeah. back on that. Uh -huh. You and I just had dinner with how many really smart stu uh, oh, students uh -huh. here? Yeah. What, 30 of them or something, uh -huh. or yeah, whatever the did. number? Yeah. And they asked questions, and, and I said to you afterwards, what? You said they were brilliant. Yeah. And I said, I wasn't asking that kind of questions when I was a student here. They were smart, thoughtful, probing questions. And, and by the way, we'll get to some of those because yeah, they, they have right, them here. Because they're hard. But let me, let me pick up on this just a little bit. I mean, so you've talked about being at the Vatican. You've talked about being at the UN. I mean, you started in Ulysses, Kansas. It's Ulysses. Okay. Ulysses, okay. Everybody mispronounces it. Like, yeah. Like and, 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 that's, Grant, okay? and that's the way they know whether you belong there, that's right? right? That's right. You show up in town and, okay. It's not Frisco, it's San Francisco, yeah. right? Same deal. Okay. okay. So where, where did you find that chutzpah to step into these places? Like you said, it's uncomfortable, right? Scary, really scary. And, and how, how did you step in and survive and thrive? I don't think I always survived, and I certainly didn't always thrive. Uh -huh. um, I, I started finding myself in situations that were uncomfortable, where I was completely tongue-tied, and I would drive home from whatever the setting was mm -hmm. thinking, oh, that was so dumb. How did you not know how to answer that question? And, and I will admit, I've had kind of an interest in this since I was little. Like, 
if you could, I grew up on a large, large grain farm, farm, thousands and thousands of acres with lots of space. And even when I was little, I would find myself walking and pretending like I was being interviewed. How weird is that? But okay. I just wouldn't, I'm going, okay, I'm out here with the cows. It's me and the cows. And I'm, talk, I'm being interviewed and thinking, that's nuts. So I kind of have had an interest in it. But I suppose it was a lot of embarrassing situations where my answers weren't very good that caused me to start to practice. So the UN is an example of practicing for that environment, but I've had a lot of occasions when I've, I'll be driving somewhere and I'll thinking, okay, how would you answer this question? Or we're being attacked for this, how should I talk about that? What would make sense about that? Uh -huh. So it's practice, I think it's okay. practice. Yeah. And then I have, Friends and, that are smarter than me that I'll sometimes try out my answers and they'll say, yeah, go back to the drawing board on that. And, and what's your tolerance for that discomfort in those settings? You know, I, somebody told me years ago, and I hate this statement, that you never grow until you get outside your comfort zone. And I just think there's some truth to that. Yeah. You tend to grow because you struggle more than you struggle when you're in your comfort zone. And every time I say that, something the bottom falls out of my life and I have to struggle again. So if something bad happens to me, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess one thing I want to emphasize maybe with the students here is that this is where you're going to find yourselves in a very short time. Moments. It's, you are going to be stepping into places where it feels like, how did I end up here? You know? Um, and yet, this is exactly where the Lord wants you to be sometimes, is in those, in those places. I mean, and so you look to stories like the story of Esther, you know, for such a time as this to step into the breach. And um, I think sometimes as Latter-day Saints, we can have a little bit of an inferiority complex. Have you, ex have you felt that sometimes? That sometimes we feel like, I mean. To this day. Uh-huh. Yeah, to this day, I'll drive home saying, oh, that was so dumb. You said this, and Elder Gilbert was sitting there. That is so dumb. <laughs> he already knows how dumb I am, but nonetheless, no, I, I've struggled with my self-image my whole life. Yeah, we, but, we, but there's not we enough. But have it as a culture in the church? Uh-huh, in my opinion, yes. But look, we could look around the room. I'm just looking at, at Governor and Mrs. Herbert and thinking, okay, when they were students, they probably didn't see themselves occupying the governor's mansion when you were first married and starting a family and so forth. But again, they had to figure out how to step into the breach. And at yeah. some point you just, you just do it and you either do it because you feel compelled or because somebody invites you and then you just kind of have to practice. You just try it and after a while with some experience and help from mentors, uh -huh. you start figuring out a little bit more how to handle what do I do when I don't know the answer? How do I handle that? How do I handle a tough question that I can't really say everything I want to say, but I can say enough? It's practice. I think it's practice. Okay. Let me, um, and school's a great place to get practice this moment in time. Let me pull up some questions here from our students here. Here is Tanner McKay. Uh, Tanner McKay, it doesn't say where Tanner's from, but he says, I'm interested in working in film and television in the future. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like going through Hollywood would help me have the biggest impact. However, Hollywood isn't particularly friendly to people of faith, and I wonder if I'll be snuffed out. How do you respond to Tanner? What? In the lunch, in the dinner we had before this, there was a question almost like that. Uh -huh. Uh, from, from a young student who wanted to go to L.A. Oh, right here. There she is. And I'm going to give kind of the same answer. Um, uh, as for starters, I don't know. But the second thing I would say is, yeah, Hollywood is an environment that is an environment. <laughs> and uh, fill in whatever adjectives come to mind that <laughs> suit you. And, uh, but if you keep your covenants, if you'll keep your covenants, then you'll have access to the power that flows through those covenants. 
And I think as long as you're willing to keep your covenants and have a spiritual impression that you are where the Lord wants you, he'll protect you and help you. I really believe that. And if it gets to a point where you can see that it's threatening your ability to keep your covenants, get out of the environment. Uh, no, no kind of acclaim, no kind of fame, no kind of success or even money is worth breaking your covenants because your covenants are the greatest protection you have because power flows through those, those covenants. So to me, you can compete and participate and refine your skills in a lot of environments as long as you remain a covenant keeper. Have you, um, you, you talked about trying to see a change in this cycle of where faith is muted, ignored, uh, and then diminished in the media. And you talked about wanting to see that flipped so that faith could be appreciated, emulated, practiced in different ways. Have you seen that flip somewhere? Have you seen instances of where we've seen that turn? I mean, we're, we're seeing little pieces here, but has, has that virtuous cycle started somewhere? I would say that I've seen it with individual reporters and journalists, with ind individual creatives. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe I could, can I just frame that slightly yeah. different? I've yeah. seen it, uh, what, here's what I've seen even more. The more we've started to now develop individuals of influence and some organizations with influence and presented this notion of faith in media, the more we're starting to see it give permission to people to say, well, I've kind of always believed that too. But I didn't know anybody else did and I didn't know how to talk about it or I was afraid to speak about it. So what I've really, I think what we've really started to see is that by championing this, others are saying, okay, I feel just like that. Uh -huh. But it took somebody, a group of people, again, I can't take much, if any, credit at all, but it took a group of people starting to have these conversations. It's like Seth Cohen at Forbes. Yeah. When I asked him, why does Forbes care? Because you made us care. We didn't know we should be thinking about this, but when you started talking yeah. about it and showing us the research, we said, we should care. So what I'm seeing more is people coming out and saying, okay, it's okay to talk about this. And you know what? If, we, if we're going to be really respectful of various elements of a person's identity, nationality, language, ethnicity, so forth, sexual preference, name whatever, then we should also say faith is an important element of our identity that we should care about first and foremost. And when people hear that, they go, yeah, that's right. We should be as respectful of faith mm -hmm. as we are of ethnicity, culture, race, background. Beautiful. So I have seen that. Let me uh, share from Easton Clough, a civil engineering major from Manti, Utah, who notes that you've had the opportunity to work with multiple prophets writing biographies. And he asks, what is your biggest personal takeaway from working with the prophets? Um, whoa, wow, there's so many um, that they are called by God and they're prepared by him. I, I am absolutely persuaded when you look at the life of a prophet and revelator, you can see the Lord's fingerprints all over them. You can see the Lord designing their tutorial, their earthly tutorial, so that when the time comes that they're called as a prophet, seer, and revelator, they are ready to bring with them their, their life experience and the depth of their testimony. And then you see him continuing to refine them as they serve in the Quorum of the Twelve and, and allow them to continue to grow. So I'd say... For me, number one is the Lord identifies them and prepares them and calls them, and they are his. I absolutely know that's true. What are you doing to prepare for general conference? I have been listening to every talk from a prophet here in Revelator for the last several conferences. Mm -hmm. And then I always take a question to conference, and I'm trying to figure out what the question is, and I've got two more days to figure okay. out what the question is. Um, yeah, but I, but I prepare 
yeah, one of the ways I, one of the ways I prepare is to make sure I've reviewed what they just said. Not that I haven't in the last six months, but a more fresh review. Okay. Emma Butler asks, in a church that is very focused on converting others to what we know as the truth, how can we as Latter-day Saints avoid an us versus them mindset when communicating with others? Boy, isn't that a great question. I think we have to start instantly and immediately from a position of respect. In the world in which we're living today, my goodness, believers, believers need to link arms and be respectful of each other. So let's start with just saying how grateful we are. It's Sister Pat. How grateful we are to link arms with another believer. I don't have to convince her that it's important to believe in God or in Jesus. She already believes that. And, and for me, it's, look, I was raised, I was the only little LDS girl in my high school. All my friends were of other faiths. And we all went to church with each other. They came with me, I went with them. And, um, and so it's very comfortable to me to be with those not of the faith. But I think it starts with respect and with a true, deep, sincere appreciation that there are other people of faith in the world. And then the more we interact, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, the chance comes to share what we believe and to let them know more. But I think it starts with profound respect for, for all believers. You had an interesting thing here. You noted a, an AI study that was done. And we have a question here from Alara de Hoyos, a student in uh, pre-advertising from Enterprise Alabama. Um, how do you see the church using AI in the future? Boy, that's above my pay grade, <laughs> uh, way above. But there was just uh, a report about some of the senior brethren talking about all the work they've been doing to know how to incorporate AI, just starting with church employees. And uh, the Desert News reported on that, the Church News reported on that, um, and talking about how to use it. So. I, I don't feel qualified to answer that because I would never presume to speak for the church. But they are thinking about it and have for a long, long time. And I think we'll be saying more and more uh, from some of the meetings I've said. And they'll say more and more and help us know how to look at it. How the church, the church will be able to use it for sure. And we'll have to be careful too. It's all, it's all those things. You don't think anyone's used this yet for a sacrament meeting talk? <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> We've, we have a but not a very good talk. Not a very good talk. Yeah. Hey, we, we have a number of questions that are kind of along this line here. Uh, this is from Natalie Aldous, a communications uh, major from Nampa, Idaho. How do you handle interactions with those who feel alienated by our belie your beliefs based on their past experiences with religion? For example, LGBTQ former members of the church. If their hurt is valid, how do you share your faith without discrediting their experience? Every situation is different. I've, uh, I've had to learn a lot about this and how I handle it individually. Uh, if I go back I, some years, I can think of some things that I said that I'm really sorry I said. And so I've had to learn better how to think about this. But I can tell you where I've come on it, regardless of what the issue is. And I'm going to use, um, without identifying anyone, or with, without identifying the person involved, I'll just say, uh, share an experience with a member of my family. So I'm thinking of a member of my family who I adore. Adore this person. And uh, have known since the day she was born. And I could tell you all the great things about her. And uh, at the moment, she's um, a completely disaffected from the church and a little bit mad about everything. And I think one day uh, she was really nervous. I started feeling like she was distancing herself from me. Mm -hmm. And so one day I just asked her about it. And... Uh, and she said, well, I know what you believe, and I just don't believe that. And I said, okay. 
I said, so let me tell you what else I believe. Yeah, I said, yes, I do. You know how deeply I feel about the gospel. But I said, here's what I also believe. I don't believe you have to believe what I believe. We actually believe in agency. I believe you get to choose what you believe. And I love you because of who you are. And I will love you every day of my life and beyond because of who you are because I just adore you. But I said, you don't have to believe what I believe. Now, if at any time you want to talk to me about the gospel, I'll talk to you about it all day long. But if you don't want to talk about it, I won't talk about it. I am not your judge. I am your, and then I listed what I am to her. Uh-huh. And I do believe that. I, so I try in situations one-on-one in particular. And again, I've had to learn because I made some missteps some years ago that I've really regretted and had to figure out how to do better. And I really try to let somebody know, I'm not your judge. I believe what I believe, but I just care about you or are interested in you or love you for who you are. But I had to come to that. It took me some practice. It took some time to think through how to navigate, not backing away from my, what I believe, but giving someone else space. And if they want to talk about how they think the church has wronged them, I'll let them talk as long as they want to talk. And then I'll, I'll share whatever I, I'll ask them, do you want me to tell you what I think or not? Do you just want me to listen or do you want me to talk? And they, it seems to put everybody at ease to say, okay, she's not going to lecture us and she's not going to judge me. And I don't. I just don't. But I had to learn that lesson the hard way, honestly. Yeah. No, thank you. And, and one thing we've always appreciated is just how frank and honest you've been. It's yeah. that farm girl thing. It is. You yeah. can't get rid of it. And <clears throat> that probably takes us to our last question here tonight. <clears throat> You're going to love this one. This is Haley Jones. <clears throat> and I don't know where Haley's from, but Haley asks, why don't you have a biography published yet? <laughs> I love your lectures and talks and would love to learn more about how your life experiences helped you to reach this point will never happen. <laughs> no, that just sounds like pure torture. <laughs> who, who would you have write your biography? No, no. No, come on. Let's... This isn't a conversation. We're not, having, <laughs> we're not having this conversation. It sounds just horrible. I'm, I'm... I said to somebody that I did the biography for, I said, this is awful, isn't it? He said, yep, this is awful. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm going to make this as painless as it can be. But no, it just looks horrible, and I'm sorry I've inflicted that pain on anybody. (laughs) Well, Sherry, this has been an absolute delight to have you back at BYU. We hope you'll come often. Thank you, Paul. uh, Thanks for the invitation. And we'll have the opportunity to enjoy a reception out here. And I think the weather's nice enough. If you want to pour out onto the patio this evening, you can do that as well. Let's provide a big round of applause for Sherry Dew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is great. I think we'll just... Okay. I'll follow you. I'm going to walk down behind you.